All right, can one of the attendees jump in chat and just let me know that you can see my screen and that welcome page? All good, thanks Katie and welcome. Ian, Craig, love it, Tanya. Sam, thanks guys, good to see you all. So um, welcome to the uh, Oz Agritech meetup here on regenerative agriculture. Um, or I should start the slide deck on the right page. Uh, so my name is uh, Sarah Nolette and I am super proud to bring you this meetup from Agfentic, Platt Farm and SproutX. I'm the founder and CEO of Agfentic and we're an innovation advisory firm working in agriculture and technology here in Australia and elsewhere in the world. And we're joined by some awesome panelists tonight that you will hear from in a second. First, just briefly some housekeeping. So you'll notice for anyone who hasn't joined Zoom in the last couple of weeks, which I think is highly unlikely in this world, but just in case, uh, you are on mute, but there's a chat function for banter and questions and sharing. If you do have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function, because we'll be looking at those throughout uh, the meetup and throughout the chat to, to bring those to the panel. You might also notice that Richard, one of our panelists, is in person in Adelaide, because our South Australian friends are very lucky to be in person here tonight. So hello to our SA friends. Uh, and this is a test for technology to see if we can uh, make this work in a couple different geographies and, and formats. In terms of social media tonight, would love if you guys can be tweeting along, sharing along uh, at home and getting the conversation going. We've put up the Oz Agritech hashtag, which we'd love for you guys to use. Oz Agritech is the peak body for ag tech here in Australia. We'd love to continue to get momentum around that hashtag and this peak body as we get it off the ground here in this formation phase and continue to advocate for the agri tech sector here in Australia. And of course, our guests and sponsors uh, on those uh, hashtags as well. We also have some industry news in the ag tech space here in Australia. A couple of our startups in Australia are, have been selected for the Thrive Forbes Demo Day, and we'd love to get everyone to vote for them. So while you're watching right now, hop on to the URL that's up and vote for Platform and Hive Keepers so we can support Australian agri-tech globally as they compete. And congrats again to Platform and Hive Keepers. If someone could share that in the chat so I can move on to the next slide, uh, if anyone's able to get that up so no one misses it, that'd be great. In terms of who's in the room, as you guys know, we love to see who else is on this call. So we'll pop up a quick poll here if we can, just to get everyone's thoughts uh, or, or everyone's vote on uh, where they sit. So you should see uh, poll pop up there. Uh, panelists, I think you won't be able to vote, but everyone else should be. We'd love to hear both who you are and then where you sit on the Regen Ag discussion. Uh, we'll do a bit of that poll again at the end and see if we've changed anyone's view. Is it good business? Is it greenwashing? Is it neutral or does it depend? Or are you not yet sure? And maybe we'll test it again at the end and uh, see how we go. Awesome, lots of votes coming in, really good to see. Look at that, so we've got uh, a bunch of entrepreneurs and startups, we've got 21% uh, producers, which is really exciting. And in terms of the Regen Ag discussion, we've got good business, we've got some greenwashing, uh, lots of neutral and some not sure. So good for you panelists to note that as we jump in and we'll see how we go at the end if it's, uh, if it's any different. So we have three amazing panelists here tonight, but I won't take up any more of your time by explaining who they are. I will let all of them do that themselves. And first up, we, oh, so just in terms of how the format will work, we will do five minutes from each of the panelists and then we'll hop into a discussion. And I've asked them to answer kind of who they are and what their views are, of course, on Regen Ag and, and how they bring that to life in their farms and, and businesses. So with that, we will turn it over, uh, hopefully seamlessly to Richard in person in South Australia. 
Thank, thank you, Sarah. I hope you can hear me. Um, evening, everyone. Everyone live here in Adelaide and everyone uh, joining us on the web. Um, this is all new to me, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I don't make a complete deal of myself. Um, I'm a wine grower from uh, McLaren Vale in South Australia and um, a 2019 Nuffield Scholar, where I spent uh, 12 months of the year uh, last year, you know, going around the world looking at you know, what is regenerative agriculture and um, you know, where does it sit in terms of vineyard, uh, the vineyard industry. So it's a massive subject to try and sum up uh, in five minutes. But we're, we would say, I would say in terms of our brand and our business, we're on the journey. We've uh, implemented uh, most of the practices uh, on uh, one of our farms and we're using um, a number of them across a few others, as well as some, uh, some consultancy business that we do. So we're in the testing phase, I would call it. Um, we're seeing some interesting results, but um, you know, we're still, there's still a lot we don't understand about it and there's still a lot we don't know, but we're, we're working our way through that. So I just quickly, you know, I just want to quickly make a few points, obviously five minutes just to sum it up. You know, really what we're talking about here is, a, you know, system change from, from what we've been doing traditionally. Um, I'll have a very vineyard centric take on this, but, you know, just supplement if you're in the farming industry, your, industry, your business and, and we're working with the sub, same sub substrates. So Sarah, if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is the real, this is the crux of the, you know, the argument that we're really talking about, you know, on the left hand, uh, as you're looking at it on the left hand slide, we're talking about that, you know, magnificent um, um, structure, which is solar energy into, um, into potentially carbon in the soil through water and air absorption through plants. So it's that, it's that context that uh, what, what is driving the majority of the regenerative ag systems, um, but it's how we utilize them and how we um, get the most out of it that's really up for discussion and it's something that we're starting to work towards. On the right hand side, you know, we then break it down into, you know, what is carbon and what does it do for us? You know, we know it's great for soil structure, we know it's good for aeration, particularly good for, you know, for, um, increasing the available water in soil, but none of that happens without the biology in the soil. So all of this stuff has to work in harmony and how do we do that? We need, we need plenty of plant cover, we need plenty of diversity in the soil to do that, and we need to give that system a chance to do it um, regularly and without too much disturbance. We know that cycling carbon, you know, carbon is a cycle, it's used, you know, the microbes use it, the plants use it, um, we're not necessarily talking about sequestration here. I'm talking about how to maximise the system to improve our soil organic matter, our soil structure to give our plants that we're growing in it resilience, you know, given that the, the seasons we've got are becoming a bit more challenging. That's the real quick upshot of it. So Sarah, if we go to the next slide. And what we can do, you know, the main driver of that is obviously the plant life that we use on it. So if we use a vineyard system, for example, you know, we've got a, we've got a permanent planting there that we can utilise, but we've also got a considerable amount of land that perhaps we can use in a slightly different manner. And this is an example, you know, this is just a simple example of root structure. We can use them as tillage tools. We can use them to deliver nutrient to different soil depths. We can use that for different microorganisms like different plants. So there's a whole heap of diversity there. And the more we have above the ground, the more we're going to have below the ground. And that's going to help drive the system. So it's a very simple concept in that respect, but complex in a lot of other ways. Next slide, Sarah. So just to sum up where we're at in terms of our thinking in the vineyard industry, you know, this is a very typical you know, site for, for vineyards. It's actually one in McLaren Vale. You know, it's neat, it's tidy, um, it's manicured. It's not something you would see normally in nature if we look at it from that context. You know, there's some good things going on there. We've got soil coverage in the middle. We've got some green um, plant material. We've obviously had some under vine, but you know, potentially we can upskill that. You'd say that. I'd say that's a vineyard that's certainly got potential. It's doing some good things, but maybe we can drive that system a bit stronger with some plant diversity and some more cover and the way we manage it. So if we go to the next slide, you know, here's a couple of examples that we don't necessarily know where, this is a continuum that we're on. We don't know, you know where we're up to here, but we know that some stuff's clearly not good for the soil. You know, as a good example that I saw in Central Valley in California, I, I doubt anyone can explain to me that there's any merit in any of that, okay? So if we stop doing some of the things that are really bad for the soil and start concentrating on some things that are good for it, 
perhaps we'll find out, you know, what things are, you know, the really important bits and the bits that aren't. So Sarah, you know, the next slide. You know, there's a bit, so we've gone from cultivation to seven herbicide passes a year to control what little organic matter we've got in the middle of the row. So I don't think anyone can argue that that's a sustainable or even a regenerative path moving into the forward. So we've got to have a plan B uh, because this isn't, this isn't something that's going to take us uh, into farming in the future. So what does, you know, what do vineyards look like uh, going forward? Well, perhaps the next slide is where we need to be. So here we've got same country, Napa Valley, you know, very diverse mid-row ecosystem, lots of flowering plants delivering um, benefits to the system with arthropods and all sorts of flowering, uh, all sorts of um, you know, insect control. We're obviously going to have a very diverse root system underneath the ground. We've got total cover. Um, it's not bothering the vines at all. You know, how we manage that is the challenges for vineyards you know, moving into the future. But, I, you know, I think we can all see that there's potentially benefit there. Uh, in, in, in having vineyards looking more like that rather than the three previous slides. So without taking up any more time, Sarah, I think that sort of sets the context for where, I've, you know, where I'm looking and where, I, where we're trying to get to in terms of the journey. Awesome, Richard. Thank you so much. Really great to see. Uh, next up in terms of overview slides, we've got Toby from Impact Ag sharing a bit on what he's been up to in the natural capital space. Toby, do you want to share your screen directly. How's that looking, Sarah? Yep, all good. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, Richard. Uh, some great photos there. I've got a few graphs to uh, partner with some of those photos. So I'm from Impact Ag. Uh, we're an asset manager um, based in Armdale, New South Wales, and we've got farms in Queensland, New South Wales, and Western Australia. And all of those are on a uh, are being managed regeneratively, or not, and are on a journey to transition to, to a <coughs> excuse me a, a better ecosystem. Some of those we've been managing for ten plus years, and others uh, we've just purchased so uh, earlier on in that uh, journey. So before. I start to show you some of our results, I probably need to uh, define uh, regen ag, which is uh, sometimes a dangerous thing to do. But we see it as uh, a regenerative ag, uh, as any farming system which aims to actively and profitably improve, improve the farm's natural capital. So soil, biodiversity, uh, and the water cycle. So any, any management activity or management decision that, it, that leads to an improved um, ecosystem broadly, that's about as broadly as you can get it, um, can be defined as, as regen ag. So once uh, we've defined it, um, we have to start measuring it. And at Impact Ag, we are a data-driven business. So all our decisions uh, need to be based on factual evidence and data. So uh, the first thing that we focus on when it comes to measuring is productivity and financial metrics. If it's not profitable, it's not gonna be successful. It's not gonna be sustainable. So uh, we're not a non-for-profit. Investors won't place their hard earned with us unless we can uh, provide a return for them. Beyond that, um, we seek uh, and are seeking more and more to measure our impact um, in a manner that will uh, offer us to uh, monetize that natural capital. Um, and we do that because we see that as the ultimate reward and the uh, ultimate certification for it. So I'll just go through a couple of very, very quick um, case studies to uh, present you know, what I've just explained. This is a graph from uh, the Wilmot Cattle Company in Northern New South Wales. Uh, you'll see a blue dotted line, which is the trend rainfall going down. You'll see a green uh, line, which is the soil carbon, uh, soil organic carbon levels going up. So this is a business that uh, primarily through um, grazing management was able to improve their soil health and productivity. And the measure here I've used is soil carbon. Um, so they've gone on a regenerative journey from 2010 through to 2016. And then they've 
more recently had some very tough years. And I think Regen Ag, you know, when you get in climate conditions that enable you to impact the landscape you're working on, you've, you've got an opportunity to regenerate it. When you go through a couple of years like we've just had, and the rainfall shows it here, the focus needs to be on protecting that landscape. So, you know, when you're able, regenerate it, uh, when you need to protect it. Um, and as I said, data-driven business, and we've got a bit of a case study that the My Grazing guys uh, did for us on this asset, Bart Davidson. And this was on a small case study of a, one paddock on this property that went from 60 hectares to nine paddocks of six and a half hectares. And over a four year period um, through My Grazing, we, we measured a doubling of grass yield or an increase in 220 kilos per hectare per 100 mil. So that to me sounds like good business. The second and last of the case studies is uh, uh, this one from a, a Southern New South Wales um, sheep and cattle business, but mainly focused on wool. So the grey dotted line being uh, average rainfall, the blue columns being rainfall received, and the green column, uh, the green shading soil organic carbon. So again, you'll see that with uh, good rainfall, these guys were able to increase soil carbon um, more recently, that's plateaued. They had a very, very tough year in 2019, and it goes to protect their land. Uh, destocked to protect their landscape. These guys um, use drought lots, um, which some may or may not consider regen because of an input coming onto farm, and I can understand that. But this is just two examples of different methods, different tools used to regenerate being primarily grazing management in good years and protect in other years. Red line is uh, earnings per 100 mil of rain. And you see through that climate cycle, this farm was able to, to maintain profitability. The big spike being a good uh, wool year uh, price in 2017. So uh, that's probably enough from me. The other thing I was gonna mention, Sarah, was, um, you know, what opportunities are there to monetize natural capital and how we're pursuing those at the moment. And there's a list there. The first two, are, you know, they're ready markets um, with billions of dollars in, in regards to carbon and hundreds of millions of dollars in various states and territories for biodiversity that we're pursuing. Uh, the next two, water and green finance uh, in development. Um, but reef credits is an example in Queensland of something that's, that's becoming active. And product premiums, I would, the only comment I would say there, there is significant um, upside to product premiums, but they have to suit the rest of your enterprise mix and, and provide you the flexibility to practice uh, your, you know, uh, or to, to uh, implement your, your regenerative uh, management activities. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Toby. Um, you did cut out a couple times there. So while Will's going, if you're able to check your connection or what you might be able to do there, that might help for the discussion. Um, you're just breaking up a bit. Um, our last panelist is Will. And Will comes to us from Tasmania. He spent a long day wrangling sheep, I think. Uh, so I'm sure he's not tired at all. Uh, but Will, over to you. G'day. So can you guys hear my audio okay? Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. I swapped over to earpods a minute before we started. So, um, yeah, I'm a seventh generation farmer down in Tassie. Uh, basically been here since original land grant. Um, what that means is we have a lot of junk lying around. Uh, seven generations of social history as well. So social capital, as I term it, understanding our landscape. And our business has been incredibly diversified over those generations. We've gone from 100,000 acres uh, you know, currently I'm farming about 4,000 acres or 1,700 odd hectares now. Uh, a mix of grazing, overhead irrigation with pivot irrigators and running a mix of uh, poppies, barley for sheep feed and dairy feed, wheat um, and for fattening lambs. Our business, has, that's my core business as such, but however, we, my father pioneered the deer industry in Australia. Uh, first, we got one of the first four permits to farm deer. We farmed deer, killed on the farm. Um, we uh, milled flour. We've got Australia's oldest flour mill. We have grown all sorts of boutique vegetables. We started small scale farmhouse cheese making, milking sheep and goats, selling direct to restaurants, uh, growing 2 million strawberry runners a year, um, all that sort of stuff alongside running, you know, still 10 to 15,000 sheep 
on our properties as family businesses and it's seven generations of succession which is quite hard to manage I can to put it mildly so my background is this big farming business but I'm also a pretty curious character so I ended up going to uni did a Bachelor of Ag Science uh, came back for a year which was the 05, 06, 07 drought in Tassie so we got hit really hard where we are is a very much a microclimate and we get we get a bad hit so I had the millennial drought of 2000, the, what was it, 05, 06, 07, uh, 08, where we had cut off our water rights, which is like cutting off your head uh, to our business. And we, we had all this other diversification and we worked very hard at what we were doing. Um, but we come off this base of very standard conventional farming. I wish I farmed beer, but I don't. I do poppies. My cousins make beer. Um, I'm, at the, I'm at the point where... I came home in the drought, I looked for something else to do and I went and did a PhD in molecular genetics. I enhanced long chain omega-3 in Australian lamb and got stuck into that space, which is somewhere I never thought I would go. So feeding green grass to sheep basically brings up omega-3. Uh, that then led me down the pathway of a postdoc position dealing with all the state salmon waste. So I dealt with literally hundreds of thousands of tonnes of salmon guts, heads and frames, stinky pinkies, and turning them into value added products instead of them being buried in the ground. So I have a very sustainable, uh, what a word to use, uh, ethos towards farming. I am very passionate about, um, you know, the next generation. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're one of the oldest farming businesses in Australia, we've been told. So we, you know, we take care, we, re we regenerate our land. It's what we do. If we didn't, we weren't regenerative farmers, but I use all the inputs you can imagine. And, the reason I fear regen is, um, and I'm quite anti it, is it's the magic pudding. Um, it just, it's the gift that keeps on giving is what they're promising. I understand the concept of soil carbon. We've been direct drilling for 40 years. Um, we, my organic carbon levels in all my soils work. I try and conserve ground cover, but I also recognise I extract a huge amount of resources from the landscape. And no matter how hard I try, um, biological activity is driven by 100 mil rain, you know, per 100 mil rain is driven by it, and you just can't put it back in. That's my ethos. And we are running a mining operation, but how we use that operation and how we understand it is, is what I really care about and believe what a conventional farmer is. I mean, I see it in grazing all the time where one of the biggest things you can do is learn to graze. And I'm in a business that was very run down from two droughts in a row, succession, and, uh, you know, fences that didn't hold sheep in, or, or, or P levels of two to one, where the optimal is 20. You're talking $700 a hectare to bring it back up to just base capital level. Uh, we had the capital stripped out of the business pretty aggressively into diversification. And I've been working for three years really hard to bring it back up. And it, it's almost uneconomical because while you, my father was a very skilled grazier and um, you get these, you learn how to read grass and graze properly and keep ground cover, come in on three leaf, do your feed budgets, and all of a sudden you get these massive, massive gains. You, you grow the weeds you've got, you eat the weeds you've got, you change the weeds you've got in that way in your business. And I'm, I get really challenged by this idea because regen uh, really invigorates the end consumer. The buy-in is massive for it. It is such a clever word because what is the opposite of regen? I'm a degenerative farmer. I'm not regenerative. I'm like, turn around and say, 200 years on the same patch of dirt. I irrigate, I use for it, I drive tractors, um, I import nutrients and I export heaps. And I'm making money, I'm happy, and I think my landscape looks good. So I get very torn by the whole concept. Um, ultimately in agriculture, anyone who's smart and switched on, who's a good manager and a good business head on them, is going to succeed in ag regardless. Um, especially if it's your own business, you've got that buy-in. And I think... Where regen really fits in quite well is, is in corporate agriculture in particular, where it's in corporate systems, there's no buying and ownership of the land. There's not that, that connect that a lot of businesses get when they just go on a spread style of farming. Um, so to me, that buy-in is important and branding works really well for that because it makes the companies buy in and makes their managers, you know, it's an accountable parameter. But for me, the unfortunate thing is I just don't quite agree with the structure. And I, I put the fear of God in me that I'm watching people get really good at grazing, go and utilise a heap more feed, grow a heap more feed, they can up their stocking rate because I've just learned to graze. And uh, 
then you turn around and say, no, you don't need to put on phosphate. Well, I can tell you now what happens after 15 years of drought and dry spells and diversification, you're in the, you can't grow anything. It's, it's really hard. And I have healthy soils that have been lightly stocked. You know, we weren't heavily stocked and um, bringing them back up. I use everything from single super phosphate. I've just put on uh, hundreds of thousands of litres of fish guts over the last few months. Um, you know, we use all sorts of systems. But I think the key is looking at the system. And I mean, my mind's very analytical being a scientist, um, but I carry a lot of passion as well being a farmer's son. And for me, you know, it's, it's that magic pudding equation that puts the, puts the fear in me about the whole system. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here not as an antagonist, but yeah, to me, I just don't buy in. And I think that's the important thing. And the consumers are buying in left, right and centre, but you don't see farmers buying in. And to me, that raises alarm bells. When a brand is holding the system up and saying, this is it, and you're not getting farmers buy in, it, it, I just smell a rat. That's uh, being the pessimist within. So looking at that system and trying to find um, a happy medium that cares about the future and the landscape and, and everything from climate change to organic carbon to ground cover to erosion, things I care deeply about. I'm helping build the sheep sustainability framework at the moment for the, for the country. And I'll put the effort in and I believe any conventional farmer can do that. So awesome. I think that's Thanks, the start of well. my point. But we better roll into a chat, eh? <laughs> yeah, I reckon. Um, I, I want to jump to Richard, actually, or back to Richard, to to hit on that the the points Will's making. Is that consistent with what you're seeing globally that farmers aren't buying in, or maybe there's a difference in corporate farms versus family farms in terms of buying that you might have seen overseas? Um, look, it's this. I think the regen thing's still still gaining ground, to be honest, Sarah. I mean, I, the, all of the places I went to, I think most of them started as either organic or biodynamic. Certainly in our industry, biodynamic is quite strong. Um, so I think they start there and then they transition. What I, I mean, what I like about it, and I don't, I don't d disagree at all with some of Will's points. And I, uh, you know, if anyone's interested, I, you know, my reports out and and my addition to the the principles that are well written about is that the nutrient balancing in landscape is important. And I don't think we should get hung up on, you know, whether that is a bit of well-timed synthetic or whether there's some organic or whether there's a bit of both. What I like about the potential of regen is that we take the best out of a lot of these systems and it's about finding the bit that suits you. Now, these aren't, these aren't off the shelf things. They're a set of guidelines um, that I think you can use that suit your business so um, in that context i think there's interest in it i'm interested in it because um, i think there's there's huge upside in the the piece of land that the wine industry's got that they currently use to drive tractors on and really don't think about how they can be utilized for you know the ecosystem benefits for the vineyard as a whole you know so that's a very narrow focus for us and, and i understand that you know and i really like some of the figures that toby's put up because that helps talk about some of the gains that perhaps as an industry we can make if we just increase some soil carbon by doing some of these things. And, and I think we'll look back to Will's point, it's valid. You're exporting, we're exporting nutrient every time we take fruit off the property. Um, I'm, I've seen some really good examples, but yet to be totally convinced in a high production horticultural setting that these systems will run and manage themselves without any inputs from us. So, you know, it's a work in progress. It's not to say it can't be done, but at the moment, you know, there's still a lot of stuff we don't know. So um, it's got grounding in the US for sure, but it's a very counterpoint to, you know, the current ag system. They're miles apart, um, and that's why it's got some voice. But whether it's across the mainstream, um, it's probably yet to be, yet to be decided. Mm. Uh, you mentioned, Will, the, the kind of brand and, and marketing benefits and how much consumers care. Toby, I know you're talking to investors in, in terms of what Impact Ag does. How, what's the investor conversation like and how much of your thinking about Regen Ag is driven by that ability to attract capital or, or really tell that story to investors or do they care about the data uh, and that kind of evidence base as well? They certainly care about the data component. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, farming can get a lot of bad press around whether it's animal welfare or climate impact. So 
for us, it's a bit about neutralizing that as well and presenting uh, agriculture in a good light, in the, in, in the best light. Um, and, you know, we're now at a position um, where we've been collecting this data and analyzing this data ourselves for 10 years. You know, it's not, we're not a business that has appeared last week and decided we're regen and, and um, you know, we're going to save the world. We're a business that is built on a decade of data at, that demonstrates that, you know, we can, uh, with lower inputs, certainly not no inputs, but lower inputs, um, with management change, uh, increase productivity, increase the returns on our assets and, and do that profitably. So that, you know, those financial metrics are obviously integral to the financial uh, or investor market. And it's about being able to present that data coherently and with enough history to, to, to uh, you know, reduce their view of risk in agriculture. Um, the other thing I would say is from an investor point of view, the, the climate change and, and being able to invest, whether it's a small uh, family investor that we deal with or a large corporate, um, being able to invest their money into something that can demonstrate that it is a low impact or it is carbon positive um, investment is increasing exponentially. And, you know, uh, as an industry, I think we are, are pretty well positioned to, to present ourselves as, as being a, low carbon investment, uh, and in the best case scenarios, a pos carbon positive investment. I'm really curious to hear from all of you about this challenge of kind of principles-based versus evidence-based and the excitement around how Regen Ag sounds and some of those climate benefits with the on the ground challenge of do I actually change what I'm doing and what level of evidence do I need before I'm actually gonna risk the, the bottom line to get started with maybe what does lack evidence, but I might believe in. H how, do you, how do you think about that balance well? I'm scared of it. Um, like in the position I was in, we, we were heavily de-stocked, he nutrients were gone, fences were gone, and it all takes capital. So, so to regenerate a landscape takes a heck of a lot of money. Phenomenal. Like I run my overdraft through the red line all the time, just trying to get that fence in to lock that north facing slope off to stop erosion to get that bit under control you know it all takes money and the worst thing about this system is it's a slow burner uh, you can pour you get these sudden benefits and you pour money into fences and, and everything and water troughs and millions of paddocks for grazing and the complexity of managing it and it's, it's a real burner on finance and i'm part of the homes and sacket benchmarking group which is one of my i love it uh, it lets me look at my business against everyone what i'm doing and, and they did a review against regenerative bag and basically on a similar asset base to me over a 10 year period, I'm a million dollars down. I'm a million dollars behind on that system. So that's hard data that comes at me. There are aspects of the benchmarking that I shudder at and go, oh, you know, but um, yeah, the philosophical challenge for me and then being an analytical scientist, like I live for data, like molecular genetics is this black box of data and associations and all sorts of give and take. And so the farming is exactly the same. Having a PhD and coming back to the farm, you know, a lot of people say, what a waste. And I'm like, no, nah, it's post hole digger. That's what it stands for. But it's actually my skill set stretched to its limit, just thinking this huge complex system and analyzing it. And yeah, I, I love empirical data, but I also go on gut feeling a lot as well. As yeah, there was a question in, in about the Holmes and Sackett data. I don't know if, if Richard or Toby, you've got comments on that kind of uh, evidence-based question as well as the, the financial performance, which, which Toby, you've got a lot of data uh, against uh, on the other side of that. Yeah, well, we use uh, benchmarking data in Holmes and Sackett. We use Profit Pro um, that other listeners may be familiar with. So benchmarking is a very important tool. Um, and we've got to uh, achieve similar uh, results or better results than industry standard if we're going to, you know, claim that we are good uh, regenerative farm managers and you can do it profitably. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, we've transitioned another a number of property properties from a from a 
conventional. It's difficult to say what it has been, but through to a, what we would call a regenerative system and done a lot of data, assessed a lot of data around the cost of that transition. And in many cases, we haven't found it to be an expensive process. Um, the Wilmot Cattle Company and Maya Grazing did a case study um, on that one paddock, uh, splitting it up uh, into nine, and they spent uh, $125 on water and wire, a single uh, hot wire and a trough system. Two thirds of that cost was in the trough system to over a four or five year period, double the productivity of that, the, the pasture production of that um, subdivision. So that's doubling the account capacity, $125 a hectare. If we were to go and buy the neighbor, the neighbor's paddock in that part of the world, it would cost us $8,000 a hectare. So um, just like you, we can't list six practices and say these six practices, uh, regen, ag and everything else isn't, we, you know, you can't also claim that that, it, that that transition is expensive or prohibitive um, because there's, you know, lots of ways to skin that cat. Um, you know, the Homes and Sackett response to the Regen report I've, I've read and, and I think makes some valid points. Um, but uh, I think there's both, in both instances, there's good key takeaways of both those reports, but um, I, I certainly wouldn't discredit, um, you know, the benchmarking data and, and the expertise that an organisation like that has. There's been some back and forth on that, I think, catalyzed by the Australian Farm Institute. I don't know if anyone uh, ha has been following that or wants to put it in chat for anyone who hasn't. But yeah, it kind of goes, I guess, to the some of the heart of the question around this evidence base and this definition. There, there's a question here from Paul around regenerative versus conservation ag, and, and there's questions around, well, is you know changing the stocking rate particularly regenerative and, and some kind of ambiguity around, is this just a catch-all marketing term or is this a actual set of things that, that has evidence behind it? R Richard, how do you think about that? You mentioned principles. H how do you think about that? Look, I think it's, it's both. I mean, we, um, we're, we'll be able to tell it. I mean, I can, I can give you some real time cost on, you know, the system change for us, because uh, like, again, I think there's, there's huge upside for vineyard, you know, and we're utilizing livestock in a couple of places um, that have, that have taken out two to three tractor passes at the start of the season for us. Now that's a, that's just a real time cost at a hundred bucks a hectare. Every time you get on a tractor to do something, you know, th that's money that's straight back into your bottom line. So that, that's an easy win. You know, some of that, uh, livestock's been leased, some of it's been grown out by us, so there's another income stream. For very, a bit like Toby, for very little infrastructure other than a hot wire in a lot of places, uh, but also like we'll, you know, some of it we've had to do some significant fencing, but it's a one-off cost. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's certainly huge potential in it, but it depends a bit where you're at. I mean, I've looked at, obviously my goal to go around the world was to pick holes in, and, and pick out the good bits out of you know, arable farming, cropping systems, you know, grazing systems, anything that looked like, that managed grass and plants um, and, and use, utilize that into a, into a vineyard uh, setting. Um, we know that we've got um, some challenges coming up around, you know, that whether it be market um, around herbicide or whether we've already got challenges around resistance to herbicide in vineyards. So that's not a feasible thing going forward. You know, if you don't have a plan B for that, you're going backwards. And we know that cultivation isn't the answer either because it's costly. You know, every time you do it, it's costing you money. And if, again, at a hundred bucks a hectare, you can't go from one herbicide or two herbicides a year to three cultivation passes because it's costing you more money and it's doing more damage to your soil. So this is where the regen bit comes in for me. Now, I just don't think we need to get tied up in the, in the term too much, okay? If we're doing something that is beneficial for the landscape, I think we can all agree on that more plants, more diverse, more cover, ticks a lot of boxes, okay? That's better than less plants, cultivation, and bare ground, you know? It's got no photosynthetic capacity at all. It does no one any good. So rather than get too worried about who's regen and what's not regen, let's focus on the things that we know work and we can, we can talk about the stuff that we don't know yet. That's coming. I'm a bit like Toby. I've, I've read you know, enough, plenty of reports that suggest both sides of the argument. 
So that tells us that we're still working on these things, but it's a, you know, it's a three dimensional system. You know, they're really hard to measure and triple replicate and do all those things. We're gonna have some that are gonna win and some that are gonna lose. So let's look at the tangible things. What it, you come back to your own system and say, what's my key goal here? Now, for me, it was to improve my water holding capacity or at least plant available water and reduce my costs. And how do I do that? And I'll look at some of these processes and do it. You know, if we go to, again, another example is, you know, cover cropping, you know, the growers that are going around putting in single species cover crops have been doing it for years. Yeah, that's doing some good, but then it takes three um, cultivation passes to set it up. There's three tractor passes. The arable guys have worked this out years ago where they just direct drill it mostly. Yeah, they use a bit of herbicide to get it right, but that's a better system than what that's doing. So let's utilize some of that knowledge and, and transfer it across into our own system. So that's, you know, that's where I sit in it. I think there's a huge benefit if we look at what other people are doing and try and pick holes or you know, pick the best bits out of it to drop into what you're trying to achieve. Will, you were shaking your head and nodding. Were you gonna jump in there? Yeah, I think that's the danger in it though. You're cherry picking it. Like what you're describing is the leading edge of conventional ag. Like I run a UAV company, operate drones all over the world and I see a lot of paddocks and a lot of data. And like you watch Cole the Corn Star or the Millennial Farmer on YouTube. I mean, they're huge conveyors of, of ag. And you watch what they're doing with a Yetta system and their press wheels and the fuel burn on the tractor. Like that's just conventional farming. It's smart farming using pressure and trash residues and, and mechanical techniques. Like that's what, that's what I fear in it. It cherry picks it and people don't see the whole concept. And like we all, we're looking at the bottom end of the bell curve in agriculture, conventional, that, that hard packed, um, vineyard there, I was just like, yep, I've seen that. You know, the plow pan, all that sort of trick. I said farming all the time. Um, the golden acres, as we call it over here, the gold acre spray rigs, the guys that just live by the spray rigs, they're, they're done and dusted in 12 years. Four cropping cycles, they're screwed. The weeds have got them. Like, just bad management. So it's good management is what you guys are describing. And I mean, Regen's just sell grazing rebranded in, in the grazing game, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it, it's exactly the same. Uh, you know, the, but the problem, the danger to me is that you're taking a beautiful concept of a conventional farming. Like I'm super high tech with what I do. The amount of remote sensing I have going on and variable applications and whatever, you know, I'm, I'm pushing it. But then Regan, you're pushing a brand out that the default position is degenerative. So if I'm a really smart, switched on, cutting edge, UAV operating, variable rate irrigator guy doing his thing, I'm degenerative, default position. And, and that bugs me. I want to jump into that tech point. There's a couple questions here, one from Sam Duncan and, and one from Ian Smith around what kind of technologies, monitoring, et cetera, are you using in, yeah. in these farms and, and especially when it comes to region ag or, or just improving soil and land management? So I run a 2000 hectare Wi-Fi mesh, private Wi-Fi mesh with something like 300 access points, everything from turning power points on and off to save energy um, through to, I have soil moisture probes in all my cropping paddocks. Uh, they measure down to 80 centimetres. I watch all my irrigation infiltration. I run variable rate irrigation on individual sprinklers. I have a kilometre long irrigator that does 200 degrees, pushes the boundaries of irrigation. Uh, a variable rate soil test, soil test every paddock, Repl uh, replace all my capital P. Uh, we've got four, five trial sites. Um, on our farm that are lifetime trial sites on tree recruitment to pasture species, um, deep core organic carbon levels of our soil, uh, north facing slope trials, like we do heaps of stuff. And I, I farm 80 k's away from the farm. I don't live on the farm as such, just the way succession panned out. And so I, I farm remotely from cameras, remote sensing. I've got weather data stations everywhere. Like I pull a lot of information in and then I'm not exceptional in what I do. I don't think in my peer group, but on the mainland, I think it's a little bit different, but yeah, Tassie's lucky in a lot of ways. That'd be good if we can get some state by state debate going as well as some regen conventional debate going. Um, <laughs> Richard, how about you? What are you using on the technology and monitoring side? And then, and then Toby jump in as well. Oh, it's same, very much the same thing, Sarah. I mean, obviously water's our, our greatest limiting factor, like most things, you know, in this country. So, you know, we're using uh, capacitance probes, real-time data for, for managing that. You know, we're working uh, closely about to, to delve into the SAP, SAP flow information on plant, um, you know, swelling and shrinkage overnight so that we can further refine not only what we know is happening in the soil, but also 
uh, what's happening in the plant. You know, for us to help validate what we're trying to do, um, you know, we're using, we're utilizing the latest tech in um, the soil biology and soil life testing to, to, to map a change over time. And we're using control blocks for that as well, where they're running, um, you know, conventionally for whatever better a term, um, where they've, you know, full herbicide, full bits and pieces, so we can understand, you know, the changes that we're trying to implement. And obviously baselining soil carbon, um, again, on, on a number of different vineyards that are under different management regimes to try and get an understanding of how quickly perhaps we can see change or do we see change and, and what we do with that. Um, over the top of that, NDVI mapping, vegetative mapping, so we can work on um, you know, stressed areas and bits and pieces. None of that's particularly new, that's been around for a long time. So we feel like we're utilizing most of the tools uh, in our toolbox and, and, and um, enough that we can you know, have a good handle on what we're trying to do with limited resource. Toby, anything you want to jump in on there in terms of monitoring measurement or ag tech? Look, I think, uh, I think what Richard and Will have, have mentioned, we use all those items. So I'm looking down that list and thinking of uh, remote sensing for water, um, soil testing, moisture probes. Um, you know, we've got specific tools like my grazing for our grazing system. We find quite valuable. So yeah, around it, I think that's similar across you know a whole raft of different enterprises and businesses. You know, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, external expertise in our business, either people that drive this technology or developing this technology <clears throat> um, on our assets. So whether that's you know remote sensing um, through satellite imagery and and calibrating with our soil tests to develop you know improved technologies and start to to measure things like soil, like soil carbon uh, remotely, um, or whether it's um, getting uh, you know trained ecologists on site or independent agros, you know when we make these claims, we spend years uh, collecting this data to make sure we can back them up. So that's either with technology, or it's with external um, expertise and external certification. Um, to, yeah, you know, I wanted to, to jump sure in, Toby, on that. On that point, sorry, you're breaking up a little bit, Toby, but I wanted to just jump in on the point around kind of knowledge and advice and expertise. Uh, there's a few questions here in terms of, you know, one, one from Christopher on what's the biggest knowledge gap in, in assessing the profitability of, of regen or, or other techniques and figuring out how you decide to adopt something or not. And, and others kind of around the role of land care and, and different advisors. How are you guys seeing the space of advice and expertise change as regen hits hits the mainstream more and are there good or, or bad sources of advice influencing adoption maybe yeah richard yeah you i go think first? if you're going to make that oh, go ahead toby look i was just going to say if you're going to make a transition um you, you do want to arm yourself with um so, some external expertise so you know when we put farm manager on um you know, there's a training program for them. You know, we uh, use RCS for that. Um, and, uh, you know, we always seek to include, you know, new technologies, external expertise, independent agros and the likes to advise us, the people doing our soil carbon projects. You know, these are all external um, ex experts that we engage to, you know, advise us on how, you know, the best pathway so we understand the cost and we understand the reward of everything that we're doing. I'm curious. It's actually one of the one of the questions. There's a few in the in the chat and things around inputs, and and that to me it actually came in through a text from from um, someone who couldn't make the meet up. Meet up. Michael is a farmer as well, and and he was saying, you know, is one of the challenges kind of emotionally or mentally around regen ag that we're really used to a system of high inputs, and and we're used to the advice we might get from input suppliers and we're used to working with um, with those providers and, and we're just used to doing it that way. And so there's some challenging kind of business model questions, maybe questions about regional communities, if we're thinking about shifting off of a high input system. Do you think that's part of this conversation at all, Will? Yeah, it's very, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, Holmes and Sackett call them parasites on your business, all these advisors and um, sales reps and stuff. And 
it's so easy to get complacent. You know, you get the free Eskies, the hat, the Leatherman, uh, the little mini bike for the kids. You know, they read you perfectly. And it's so easy to become complacent and let the parasites feed on you, basically. Um, but that comes back down to the individual, regardless of what colour hat you wear and what camp you sit in in farming. If you let them run, they'll run with you and they'll clean you up. Their job is to make money off you. So, yeah, calling a spade with them and, and forming solutions together, not just relying on an agro. And I, I, a lot of people I've seen that fall into that trap do just solely rely on an agronomist or, or someone for their, their input. And, you know, Toby's business and stuff, you know, alternative views, the data they put out and, and analysing that yourself and centering yourself around what you want to do. That's the critical thing. A good manager is going to win regardless of what hat they wear because they're managing their business. They know what it's costing to do it. They understand their impacts. Like if you don't understand your impacts, you bugger the high input farming system that's not getting a result. That's just, yeah, they'll be for sale. Give them 10 years, maybe 15. They'll be for sale. They'll be sold. Guarantee it. Richard, thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'll play devil's advocate for Will. You know, I, I can find, uh, you know, the vests and the chemical company hats and bits and pieces as well. We can get on the treadmill of, you know, continuous pest and disease control and herbicide control and that whole thing. You know, so where, you know, where do we get off? Um, you know, I keep looking at what I'm doing and saying, well, what, you know, well, am I in this for perpetuity? Do I have to continue to do this to my plants to keep them alive? Is there a better way? You know, I'm, I'm you know, viewing the lens and saying, well, how do I change? change this paradigm, um, can I do it through soil biology and soil health to a degree? Can I do it with other ecosystem services like companion plantings and bits and pieces and other things? Do I, I don't say I'm going to go cold turkey, but can I get off some of this stuff? It's a drip feed. So, you know, it works both mm -hmm. ways. Um, and, and it's just about asking those questions. You know, I, I, I just think, you know, Will's point is valid. The good managers will always analyze their business. So for us, it's about, you know, what we're looking at in terms of system change is saying, before I go out and do what I've always done, is there a better way? You know, and if you don't ask that question, then you're never gonna know whether there's another answer to it. Now, some of the, I think, I think some of the answers in, you know, I think the next big phase in ag tech will be biology and understanding how we utilize that and, and use it to our advantage and farm it. You know, some of that will be stuff that we can, we can do on the land. Some of it will be inputs, but we understand the chemistry bit. You know, we know how that works. It's been, you, we've been doing it in the green revolution for the last 50 years. Um, the next big set will be how do we make the biology do some of this stuff, stuff for us. It may well be in, 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 um, in transition with inputs, but if we don't give it a go, then we're not going to know. And that's where my mindset sits. I, I just think there's an opportunity to have a crack at some stuff. You know, don't do 4,000 acres off the top of your bat, but have a little bit in the corner where you're prepared to make a loss or you know, have a failure on that isn't gonna break you, but you might actually learn something. Because if we don't try something new, we're just gonna be on the mouse wheel for however long we're on it until it falls off the hinges. The danger of the doing that though, just little, 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 little gains again and again and again, you don't go anywhere. You just make life bloody complex. Um, I've seen it. That's what I lived through with little experiments, little gains. Sometimes just going, I've got to get off this, got to restructure it. it it's the best solution. Like to make money, you can't, you got to be in it to capitalise in the long game in ag. There's, there's no short game in it. It's a five-year system, I reckon. Three years to change something, particularly in livestock, with five years to feel a system. If you're just experimenting every year, you're just experimenting. It's just a distraction. Uh, focus on the core business. Manage it. Like, yeah, you've got to get off the treadmill. We're looking at your business, you'll see. I'm, geez, I'm addicted to MCPA every year from the thistles. Why the hell are they there? Oh, I'm grazing the guts out of them, leaving bare earth all autumn. There you go. You know, that... that ethos encouraging that and I think the best way to do it's beer have a beer with your mates you know and the more you get like it's a Tasmanian thing here we are very connected as young farmers thanks to poppies um, huge money and it brought a whole heap of us back like brought me back from a PhD and postdoc mates who are solicitors lawyers guys with some high flyers that have come back to farming um, and I think the beer economy is a big part of it because we all chat like we've got a farmers group they met last Friday I missed out you know, a lot of business is done there and a lot of this change comes through the beer economy as far as, you know, passing a beer goes and off you go and, and rethinking what you're doing and asking questions. And it comes back to the crux of that management. And I'm, just, I'm just conscious of doing little experiments continually. 
I think to get over those, you know, those little experiments, you know, every farmer wants to do little experiments. It's, it's inherent in, in yep. their you know, management of their landscape. But if you're going to go and have, have a crack at something on a larger scale, that's where you need your trusted advisor. You know, you talk about homes and suck it. They're obviously a trusted advisor to you. So we all listed a list of ag tech companies that we, um, you know, engage and, you know, one of Regen Ag's criticisms has been the lack of data and science behind it. I think that's changing and will change rapidly going forward because there's so much of a focus on it. Um, you know, whether it's academic, whether it's technology, you know, no single farmer is going to be able to get ac across that. You need to arm yourself, and that's what we, we do in our business, with those trusted advisors that will, you know, help you get that biodiversity offset or will help you, you know, generate a carbon credit. Um, or implement, you know, a new practice. So, um, you know, arming yourself with those trusted advisors. And I think that's probably basically what you're getting at, Will, whether it's your community or, or you know, an external provider to your business. Yeah, Love exactly. it, guys. Oh, go ahead, Will. No, it's that empowerment to make that change and give you confidence to change. And that's exactly what I've done. I've gone from diversification and dropped off a hell of a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah, I've just, what did you want for succession? I wanted a post driver. So I could eat, you know, eat the weeds I've got and grow the weeds I've got. Uh, my pasture base is mainly annual junk. I've hardly got a renovated pasture, but I call that conventional grazing. And then I'm grazing it off a, off a three leaf stage and all the rest. Like it's, yeah, it's that to do it, though, I've had to bite the bullet and go all of it. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to do it in little dribs and drabs. I don't think you go anywhere if you do that. And I've watched that for 40 years. There are so many good questions in the Q&A. We definitely won't have time for all of them. Some of them super technical, um, some of people yelling in all caps, which is part of any Regen Ag debate, uh, which I love. Um, I would love all of the panelists to just get one more statement in on kind of for or against and kind of the last point you'd want to make here in, in summary. And while we do that, we'll get up the poll again and, and see if we've changed anyone's mind uh, here in the last hour. So maybe uh, Richard, we'll start with you. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I'm going to—I wear my wine industry hat. I think there's too many, there's too many good things that we can uh, we can learn from uh, the other industries that we've talked about tonight. Not to not to utilise some of them in the in that that huge piece of land mass that we currently view as unproductive, but really just as a as an access point. So yeah, I'm a I'm a believer in in changing some of the way we do things, and I think there's huge upside for the wine industry to to follow some of the lead. Um, that arable ag and the grazing, um, you know, well grazed managed properties are doing. So yeah, I'm 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 on the journey to have a crack and see what happens. Awesome, Toby. Yeah, we're we're for it. We are a practitioner and supporter of Regen Ag. Um, it makes good business sense, and we've got you know a decade worth of data that's you know demonstrated to us it works. Uh, and now we're at a point where there is you know, so much technology, so much research going into this space to enable us to do it better and you know, start to add more layers of um, income from some of the North Farm products that, that we are generating or protecting on our farm. So we, you know, we've got a very bright outlook on, on our view of Australian ag and, and regions role in it. Love it. Will, we'll give you the, the last word here before I quickly wrap up. Yeah, so I'm not a regen man at all. I think it's the magic pudding. Um, that's the crux of what I've got to say. Uh, the reason behind it is regen, no doubt, will pull data up and stuff, but it's not a confined box. It's not a confined constraint. It's just cherry picking towards the good side of good farm management. And uh, anyone who manages a farm well is going to win. Um, yeah, and surrounding yourself by people that are going to help you through that journey because you can't do it as an individual is going to give you success in agriculture. And I don't like the word regen because it makes the rest of us who are kicking goals as conventional farmers be degenerative. That's the default position that really bugs me. Awesome. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Toby. Thanks to all of you for coming. Last thing for me is uh, I think we might have converted some people to good business. Uh, maybe that's, we set you up for failure there, Will, with two against one. 
uh, but maybe we just got more people to vote. I'm not sure. Um, last thing for me uh, is we will be doing another Ag Tech meetup on National Ag Day, November 20th. We'll do it in the morning to get some international guests. So please tune in and hope to see you again there. But thanks so much uh, and give a virtual round of applause and, and a cheers to our panelists. Really appreciate the frank chats here and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sarah.